Thank you, thank you so much, and it's um, nice to follow you in a positive way today. <laughs> so, we're going to think deeply now and reflect on the world to come. So, what I want to do in the next 50 minutes is take you through some of the themes that I see coming that I think it, um, is going to really shake our world. And for those of you who on Wednesday came to the School for Health and Care Radicals, what I don't want you to think is, oh my goodness, I've heard all this before and I'm just going to get it again. Okay? Because actually, um, this is a, a carefully crafted plan. Do you know that? Because there's a, there's a lot of evidence um, around, um, around learning um, around spaced learning. And what it basically says is, if you, if you go into a certain learning environment and then you have a couple of days break and then you have some of the same learning again, it's like the most perfect way of doing retention. Okay? So for some of you that came to the School for Health and Care Radicals on Wednesday, um, you're not getting repetition. Okay? You're getting reinforcement to help your learning. <laughs> um, and there's a little bit of that, but not, not, not too much. There's lots of new thinking as well. So, the ideas in this presentation come from the team that I'm part of in the NHS in England, which is called the Horizons Group. And we're part of the National Improvement Body in the NHS in England, NHS Improving Quality. But, you know, we live in a world where change needs to happen more and more quickly, more and more disruptively, uh, more of that to come shortly. And in a sense, we, we need to try and keep up with the pace of change. So the team that I work with is, is purposefully about skipping generations, you know. We've got this quote here from our esteemed former Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, and he says, you can't cross a chasm in small steps. You know, the size of the gap between where we are and where we need to be in terms of health and healthcare improvement is, is so great, you know. Um, we, it, it needs a great big leap. So in terms of the team that I'm part of and, and some of the ideas that I'm going to present to you today, it's, it's our work around skipping generations. We're skipping a generation in terms of um, our thinking about how to create large-scale transformational change. We're skipping a generation in terms of our wider level of connection, which means that much of our work, not all of it, is actually skipping a generation into whom, in terms of who we connect with. So much of our work is with young and emerging leaders, um, uh, trainees and, and students. And the reason for that is really clear, because if you look at the evidence around breakthrough change thinking, what it basically tells us is if it's the same people from inside the organisation, you know, trying to come up with the new ideas, then we'll only get so far. That if we actually want breakthrough thinking, then we need to bring ideas from outside and we need to bring in ideas from a new generation. And we work with both, as, as well as people inside the existing system. And we're also skipping a generation of methods for change, which means that we build on you know, many of our fantastic existing change methodologies. So we work with Lean, we work with Six Sigma, we work with Model for Improvement, and so on. And we work with the new generation of change methods. You know, open innovation, open source, digital connection, um, social media on a scale that nobody could, would consider. Um, change platforms, I'll tell you about those shortly. Hacks, you know, that's the kind of work that we're doing. And um, in, the, in the Horizons team, in NHS Improving Quality, there are 11 of us. And the idea is that 11 people, actually, if we create the, the right kind of leverage and the right kind of connection, we can change the world. So, you know, this talk this morning is about, uh, you know, themes, trends that are going to shake our world. So we're very much looking forward, and, and all of us need to be looking forward, you know, to a, a, a different world. Okay, one of the issues for us is that, you know, so many of the problems, I think, or the things that hold us back are our mindsets, the way that we think about change, and um, the way that we think about how patients should have care. And what, what tends to happen is it, it's that mindset of the past that actually hijacks 
the, the potential of the future, I would say. I love this quote from Peter Drucker, and he says, the greatest danger in times of turbulence, and it's certainly a turbulent time to be in health and care at the moment, is not the turbulence itself, okay? It is to act with yesterday's logic. And uh, I've got another one here. I really like this one. Uh, this comes from Greg Sattel, and he said, you know, part of the problem is that, that you know, too often, to work out what we need to, to do in the future, we look back in history. And the problem is that even if we do that very well, history can blind us to, to great possibilities. And, you know, we've got to work in a way where it's not the rhythms of the past that define us, but our dreams for the future, okay? In terms of, you know, what do we want for our own family, um, for our patients, for our communities, for our organisations, you know? Let's focus on those dreams. So... What I want to do now is just take you through some, some basic principles in terms of where the world is going and what is happening um, with regard to change in our society. And as part of our work in the Horizons team, we work with people from all over the globe, you know, change leaders, researchers, futurists, various kinds of um, practitioners and quite a lot of crazy people. And what's interesting is that Whoever you talk to, and whatever industry or sector they come from, actually people are predicting the same kind of trends or, or, or seeing the same kind of forward motion. So what I want to do now is give you a really quick summary of some of those trends. And we talk about it in the context of you know, seismic shift. Because the change that is going on with regard to change is not small scale and incremental, it's massive. So the first trend that we see is... Um, an, an emphasis, a, a focus much more on change that is very large scale, that is highly disruptive, disruptive innovation, okay? Change that is happening more and more quickly. So in a sense, we are moving into a world where small-scale incremental change, which absolutely is important and has its place, isn't enough, you know? Change is becoming much more disruptive. The second thing that is happening that is a massive impact on change moving forward um, is the revolution that is happening with regard to digital connection. And, you know, any one of us in the developed world can connect with, link up with um, people virtually um, anywhere else, okay, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I know certainly um, from my work as somebody who's out there connecting, trying to identify leading edge practice, my world has been transformed in the last two or three years because of the ability to do that. The third thing that's happening is certainly happening in our sector of healthcare, but it's happening in many other sectors as well, is that work is becoming more and more complex. You see, we are becoming a, a generation, we're moving into an era of knowledge workers, okay? And what that basically means is that the kind of jobs or work that we did in the past where you know, um, the situation that we're in was much more stable, work was more standardised, it was less complex just isn't happening anymore. And, you know, those of us that work in, in hospital settings, and, you know, you just look at our patients, you know, compared to even three or four years ago, um, the complexity, the level of acuity and sickness of our patients is so much more than it was even a short time ago. Those of us that work in primary care, you know, we're in scenarios now where many of our patients, again, just a short time ago, would have been under the care of a hospital specialist. Now we manage them fully in primary care. Now... As work is getting more complex, there is a specific consequence of that. And that is that the power of hierarchy is diminishing. You see, because when the world was, when the work was less complex, we could neatly, you know, um, put people into little divisions, okay, and they would sit there and do the work nicely. But as the work becomes more and more and more complex, we can't contain people and we can't contain the work in the same way. And those of us that have got positional authority, you know, we used to be able to pull a lever down the organisation and people would jump. But now when we pull the, the lever, they, they just sit there. So, um, <laughs> so you know, we, um, we have to find um, other ways of, of, of connecting as leaders or additional ways. And finally, and we'll come back to this um, later on, um, a, a very clear trend across the world, across industries and sectors, is that change is moving to the edge of organisations. And what we mean by that is that if you look at the research and development functions in big corporate um, organisations, or you look at the change leadership or the organisational development functions, 
Those functions used to be right in the heart, in the middle, in the core of organisations. What organisations are doing now is moving them right out to the edge because they need to be moving and learning and growing really, really quickly. And you can't do that if you're contained in the middle of an organisation. You know, you've got to be on the edge. You've got to have one foot in and one foot out and connecting with people all over the place. Otherwise, you don't keep up. Okay? We'll talk about the implication for us as, um, as a healthcare improvement community a little bit later in this talk. So what I've done here is I've sought to synthesise okay, what I'm calling the dominant approach, the, the classic, typical way that we have gone about um, improving performance, um, improving care in healthcare. And I'm contrasting that with an emerging direction, you know, the direction that's coming. Now, what's important about this picture here is that it isn't a from to. We're not in a world, certainly in healthcare, where that dominant approach is going away anytime soon. Okay? It is alive and kicking. Um, but what is happening is more and more, as we're moving into an era that is more open and more social, the emerging direction is like a, a layer, a social layer that is sitting on the top. And what it means for us as leaders, agents, activists for improvement, quality, safety, we've got to be able to live in that very difficult, complex, zigzaggy place in the middle. So let's just, just talk this through um, quite quickly. So in the dominant approach, power comes through hierarchy. The people with power in our system are the people with position. You know, the chief exec, the, the vice president, the medical director. Okay? Um, but in the new world, in the emerging world, power comes from connection. So the people with the power are the people at the heart of the network, the people that are the best connected people. In the dominant approach, we talk about the mission and vision of the organisation. You know, really, really important that we do that, that we're, we're clear. But in the new world, it's not enough because we can't do transformation inside organisations um, in a discrete way anymore. You know, we're having to work with our patients, our communities, our partners in very different ways. And the only thing that will bring us together and keep us united is shared purpose. So actually focusing on shared purpose becomes a very, very important function in terms of what we do. Okay? In the dominant approach, we talk about, we make sense through rational argument. We're very focused on data. Okay? And you know, rational planning processes, very important. But in the emerging world, we're actually making sense through emotional connection. You see, the evidence on this is really clear. If you want to mobilise, engage people in change, okay, what, we have to, what, what you have to do is to be able to connect at a level of emotions and values. That's, that's where the new world is going. You know, in a sense, the old world, the dominant approach or the existing approach, you know, very often, it's, when it comes to change, it's about have to. You, know, you, you have to. Um, achieve this performance target. Okay? You have to hit this quality standard because the, it's the, what the province says you have to do. You, know? um, you, know, you have to adhere to this contract. But on the other side, on the emerging direction side, it's about want to change. You know? I want to be part of that. I'm choosing to be part of it because it's the right thing to do. And that's where emotional connection comes in. On this side, on a dominant approach, when we think about innovation, it's, often it's very top-down um, you know, leadership um, initiated. So certainly um, in my system in England at the moment, where we have some um, quite interesting and challenging uh, financial issues, you know, very often what we're seeing on that side is that the senior leadership team in one of our organisations will say, we have got to take £100 million out of our operating budget in the next 12 months. So we are going to decree innovation around the organisation. Okay? Whereas on this side, it's much more, it's viral, it's frontline, it's bottom-up, it's connecting with patients in different ways. On this side, the dominant approach, you know, the methods and approaches that we're using are tried and tested, they're based on, on a lot of experience. And this is the world I come from, you know, in terms of improvement methods. So Lean, Six Sigma, Total Quality Management, uh, Model for Improvement, you know, these, these methods are great. In the right context, they can deliver hugely. But, but, or and, we're moving into this world that's increasingly open, increasingly social. So we're connecting and we're getting our knowledge and our expertise in very different ways. You know, we're connecting with people to share ideas, to compare data. We're co-creating change with the people that use our services, with our wider communities in ways that we never did before. And finally, the dominant approach um, is largely transactional. 
And what we mean by that is that we're being held to account for a performance, okay, on a transactional basis, you know. Um, whereas on this side, the emerging direction, it's relational, okay. It's relationships that bind us. It's relationships that hold us together. And, you know, um, one of the things that we think about when we, when we think about this is um, we call it the spirit of the volunteer, okay, that people that are engaging in change in the emerging direction side of things Again, they're engaging in change because they want to, not because they have to. So even when we're in a, um, uh, a leadership arrangement, even if I'm a line manager of a, of a, a, a clinical team, actually um, I work with my own team as if they were volunteers, as if they were choosing to be part of the change, not being forced to because I'm the boss. Okay? Very different world. Um, currently, certainly in my system in England, I reckon about 80-90% of improvement and um, large-scale transformation efforts are, are driven by activities and behaviours on this side. Um, but it's starting to change. It's really, really starting to change because I think there is an absolute recognition that we can't drive the kind of change that we need that way, that actually it's a different kind of dynamic. So, you know, absolutely watch this space. And, you know, just think about this. Okay, um, this is Gary Hamill. Gary Hamill is the number one business influencer in the world, according to the Financial Times. And he says, the organisations that survive the future will be those that are capable of changing as fast as change itself. So actually, what that means for, for those of us that are organisational leaders, we better get our skates on. And, you know, when I think back, I've, I've, um, Stephen says I've been around in improvement for a very long time. Um, I've worked in every national improvement body in the NHS in England since 1998. Um, and, you know, uh, I think um, we've, we've had five different um, improvement organisations. They've come and gone in that time. And, you know, what happens is that we, we see the same cycle. You know, we start off a new improvement body, a new improvement support body, and it's got fantastic potential and we're really excited. But actually what happens is that the improvement body can't stay ahead of the, rest of, the, of the rest of the system, you know? So um, after a while, people start to question the value that it's adding. And so then it gets abolished, and then, like a phoenix from the ashes, the next one arises, you know? Um, so, but I think it's a really big issue for us, you know? How are we staying on the edge? How are we staying so far in front that we're able to stay ahead and keep adding value? Because if we can't do that, we won't exist. And, you know, we can laugh about this, you know? Um, um, you know, instead of risking anything new, let's play it safe by continuing our slow decline into obsolescence. Um, I actually think there's a, quite a lot of um, organisations in healthcare that um, think like that. Well, they don't mean to, but they do. So, just to, so in terms, you know, of these, of these transformational themes for the future, okay, a very big one for us as the improvement community is, is a very clear switch that is going on from curating knowledge for improvement, for, sorry, from creating knowledge for improvement to curating it. I'll come back to all this in a moment. And, you know, we come from a world where we're trying to, you know, do things in better ways. So we, we go out and we run improvement programs and we pilot things and we're always trying to create new sets of circumstances. But, you know, where the world is going is moving to um, a model of curation. Now, what do we mean by curation? Because often we think curation is about like libraries or um, museums, you know, um, and people that like, you know, organising things. Um, but curation in our um, uh, world means something quite different. Let me, let me show you part of the challenge. You see, you know, we've got, we're, all of a sudden we've got this digital revolution going on, you know, and, and we've got access to so much knowledge. Like if you look up fracture neck femur on Google, you know, there's, there's 39 million links, okay, or something like that. And the trouble is, like, what do we know, you know? Do, what do we know about what's right, what isn't right, um, what the real best practice is, um, what's good, what isn't good, okay? And so when, when I talk about curation, that's what I mean. I mean the process of, you know, finding the knowledge out there, identifying what's great, what isn't great, and, and bringing that back. You see, and, and there will be an increasing need for it. This is what's happening to us, you know? Just more and more and more um, knowledge that's available, you know? Because we've got access to it in ways that we never had before. So how do we know what to learn and what to absorb? 
And this is a very, very big challenge for us as in leaders of improvement, you know, because where, what's the kind of knowledge where the magic happens? Okay? The kind of knowledge where the magic happens is tacit knowledge. And what we mean by tacit knowledge is the kind of knowledge we learn by doing. Okay? The people on the ground, at the front line, who are you know, creating the magic. Okay? It's the people with the tacit knowledge, the knowledge by doing, who deliver the results. And that tacit knowledge, being able to spread that, is absolutely critical um, for the kind of large-scale change that we're seeking. However... The only way that we can really share tacit knowledge is to turn it into explicit knowledge, you know, um, which is learning by sharing, okay? And that's really difficult. And, you know, I've been part of many national improvement bodies where we're always creating toolkits and best practice guidelines and um, good practice databases and peer-reviewed good practice, you know? But does it actually work, you know? Does it actually um, lead to us sharing knowledge? Very, very few organisations are able to do this. And, and this is critically important in a social era, you see. What's the best way to spread new knowledge? The best way to spread new knowledge, and, to, and particularly to spread tacit knowledge, is around, is around social connection. You know? Actually, social connection and discussion is 14 times more effective as a means of spreading knowledge than written word, best practice databases, toolkits, etc., um, in April 2014, the, the Health Foundation, which does some really brilliant um, work around improvement, did a, did a literature review on what kinds of medium or media are, the, are, are best for, sp for spreading knowledge and what it, um, for spreading improvement knowledge. Okay? What do you think they said was the worst way to spread improvement knowledge? Yeah, best practice databases and toolkits, okay? So um, uh, I've been part of improvement organisations for over a decade. What does my organisation spend its time doing? Producing best practice databases and toolkits. You know, we're in a social era and, and we've got to work in different ways. So every one of us, you know, needs to be a curator. And, um, and these are the kinds of models that are developing for this, for this new world, you know, around um, how do I get the knowledge that I need. And this is the one that we use in Horizons. And this is a Canadian model, okay? And, um, and it comes from an amazing um, world-class um, knowledge thinker um, uh, from Ontario called um, Harold Jarkey. Has anybody heard of Harold Jarkey? Okay? We're all going to hear of Harold Jarkey. Um, and um, you, you see, we have to go miles for Harold Jarkey, and you've only got him kind of like a quick flight away. And um, I know this is his model. And he says, you know, in a new era for us as improvement leaders, we need to seek, we need to sense, and we need to share. So when we talk about seeking, it's about, it's about finding out, you know, um, what's going on and, and, and keeping up to date. And in a sense, all of us need to be, need to be doing that. Um, pulling information towards us that might be useful, but also having it pushed to us by trusted sources. And I'll show you a trusted source in a moment. Then we might be getting that information from all over the place, but you know, we might not know whether it's very good or not, or, or it might not quite be relevant to our setting. So what we then have to do is to make sense of it, okay? And we have to give it meaning, because if it hasn't got meaning, people won't connect with it emotionally. So, you know, how do we reflect on it? How do we put it in practice for what we're doing? How do we link it in with our own mental models of what we're doing in our own organisations, okay? So after we've been seeking and after we've made sense, we then share. And again, this is where we just connect, I think, on a very different level of tacit knowledge. So, you know, um, within our own work teams or, you know, our very own local work settings, how, you know, thinking about how we're sharing knowledge, testing out new ideas with our wider networks, and then thinking about our, our social, much wider networks, you know, how do we increase connections? So this is in my team in Horizons and being very future focused, okay, this is a very, very big priority for us. So one of the things that we started um, last November is that we created a knowledge hub for change activists in health and care, and it's called The Edge. And basically what we do, it, it's classic um, new era curating. So in, in the Horizons team, we, we have five topics that we work with. So um, how to be a better change activist, being a transformational leader, um, disruptive innovation and thought diversity, 
um, focusing on how we make change happen broadly and widely around scaling and spreading, and the new social methods for improvement. Those are our five topics. And what we do is we go like all around the world um, identifying the best sources of knowledge to bring back. And then we, we publish it okay, on the edge. We, we do it 24 times a year. But, the, and, and then, and, but what we're doing is we're seeking, we're making sense of it, and we're sharing it. And about 90, 95% of the, um, the knowledge that we share on the edge doesn't come from the health sector. It comes from other sectors, but we bring it back and we share it. And um, I mean, we only, we only started this in November, but already um, we're, um, we're on track to have um, 10,000 people um, signed up to it and using the edge. Um, uh, in, we should get there in the next month. Um, and, and it's like a magnet, you know, people, people really like it. But the thing about it is, it's not like a bulletin where you're like pushing information out at people. The whole idea around the edge is for people to connect around the knowledge. So it's a, um, you know, it's a hub. It's a, it's a way um, for people to connect as well. And, um, and it's free. And any of you that want to, be, uh, want to sign up for it, you just, um, you know, you just, just um, give your email address. Nobody gets spammed. And, um, and you just get it. Um, and one thing we're very excited about is um, um, uh, later this year, okay, um, British Columbia is going, to, um, is going to take over the edge. And um, we're going to have a special um, British Columbia, BC version of the edge. We're, we're very excited about that. And also um, uh, a, a group of colleagues in New Zealand are going to, do the, are going to take over an, an issue as well. Because, you know, the whole point of this is that we share. So, you know, the edge. Um, you know, it's like I said, I mean, why are we called The Edge? Because we've got one foot in the NHS and another foot out in the wider world. And um, again, here's, here's um, the, the famous, fabulous Harold Jarkey, you know. Um, in the near future, the edges will be where nearly all high-value work will be done in organisation. So those of us that work in organisational development and all of us that work in change management and improvement need to move to the edge, and quickly, you have been warned. So... You know, when I look forward into these transformational themes, you know, where do I think the biggest opportunities are? I think there are, it's two things, and I think that they are connected. We need to be the people that aren't necessarily running the big change programs and, you know, trying to make stuff happen and get people to do things. Actually, our role, I think the most added value role that we will be doing is bridge building, is connecting people with each other, you know, allowing that, that tacit knowledge to be shared, building those social relationships, enabling people to connect. And, and we're doing it in a knowledge era. So connecting and knowledge go absolutely um, hand in hand. Um, what I also predict, and I can see this coming really clearly, um, is that you know, in a sense, as improvement teams, often we're bench scientists. You know, we're helping people in our organisations in practical, hands-on ways to, um, to try out and test um, new ways of doing things. I think that we are going to move as a community, okay, less kind of programme managing, piloting, and much more knowledge leading and connecting. And another um, theme, which is absolutely happening, is we are starting to move from change programmes to change platforms. It is absolutely coming, and, it, and it's part of this same um, emphasis. And what do we mean by that? Okay. You know, in, in health and care settings, we, we run many, many change programmes. You know? um, every one of our organisations is, is organising the way that we go about change through a series of discrete programmes that are, that are well-managed and so on. So when we have change programmes, you know, we're doing these like change management approaches and and it you know it's kind of fine but but actually in our fast moving world can you manage it in this kind of engineering rational way okay and see i haven't got a problem with change programs per se and and there are lots of fantastic change change programs that get great results what i have a problem with is very often the way that we go about change programs you know too often the people at the top of the organization that want the change to happen they don't only prescribe the outcome that they want, which is fair enough, they also prescribe how we have to do it. And so how, how those of us that are at the front line, how we experience that is that it gets imposed on us. You know, you have to do it, not because we want to do it. And, and, and this push towards change platforms 
um, is a different era of thinking about change. And when we set up a change platform, what we enable everybody in our organisation or system to do, including people that use our services, hallelujah, to tackle the most challenging issues. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to unleash the collective brilliance of the people that work in our system and the people that, that, um, that use our system. And so when we have a change platform, what we basically say is we want to um, build on and learn from the wisdom of everybody in the organisation, everybody who uses our services. So we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one in a minute, by the way, so don't worry. Um, and, you know, when we have change platforms, it isn't like a, a, um, a small elite of, of people that make the decisions, you know? When we have a change platform, we want, we want loads of diversity, we want different ideas, because we know breakthrough thinking won't come when the same people do the thinking all the time. And, and when we have change platforms, okay, the leadership role is really different, because in a change programme, you know, we make the, the senior leader the sponsor of the programme, and they're accountable, and they're making sure it's happening, and they're making sure that the milestones are reached and people do what they want to do. Okay? In, in a change platform, the leader makes sure the right things are in, in, you know, um, in place, and then they get out of the way quickly. Um, and and you know, what, what leaders focus on when we're talking about change platforms is creating an environment, a set of circumstances that are receptive to transformational change where everybody can do their bit. So um, in our work, okay, in the Horizons team, okay, um, we don't inv we're not involved in change programmes anymore. All our work is around change platforms, and I'll, I'll show you um, one of the ones that we're working on at the moment. So, uh, at the moment, we have a partnership with, um, uh, with, with two publications in England. Uh, one's called the Health Service Journal, which the whole of our management community, um, all 25,000 of us, um, we, um, we read and absorb. And the other one is the Nursing Times, which is the, the main um, journal for nurses. And we have a partnership with the... Um, Health Service Journal and the Nursing Times, and we're running a 12-week change platform, okay? And we're running a campaign, and um, the, the name of the campaign is Challenge Top-Down Change. I'll show you. And, and what we're doing over a period of 12 weeks is it's very structured and organised. We want, what we want to do is to, is to come up with um, uh, the first socially constructed theory of change for the NHS, okay? So we're, we're, and that's why we're working with the Health Service Journal and the Nurses Times, because it gives us a massive um, uh, reach um, into their readership. And basically what we're doing is we're, um, we're working with the whole of that big community to say how do we need to be doing change um, in the future. In the first two weeks, we got 7,500 contributions. And it broke all the records in terms of levels of engagement with, um, with, health, ser service, um, with the health service journal. Where we've got to now um, is that we, um, we came up with all the initial ideas. And so what we've, what we've socially constructed are the, um, the building blocks for change, okay, and also the barriers that get in, get in the way of change based on the views of the whole um, of... Um, um, you know, the spectrum of people that, um, that work in and use the NHS. And um, what we, what we, the stage we're at with it at the moment is that, that based on those building blocks for change and overcoming those barriers for change, we've asked people to come up with um, their ideas around, around uh, how we take this forward. And we've got about another week of that. And then the next week after, we're going we're gonna to build on and, and, um, and, and test um, those ideas. But it's a way of engaging lots of people really quickly, you know, the, the wisdom of the crowd. So I got asked to say something about, well, what are the implications of this regarding um, performance goals and um, where do I think they're going? So um, this is like my personal view. So, um, so I think, you know, with a lot of this, you know, when we, when we think about the dominant approach and the emerging direction, okay, one of the key things about the emerging direction is we've got to focus on why. We've got to create meaning because people won't engage in the change unless we understand why. So when we talk about performance targets, I think it's or you know um, quality indicators that we've all got to achieve or minimum standards. And um, I think it's really important to go back to why we have these. And you know certainly in our system in England, we had a pretty shocking starting point. You know, we we started. You know, why did we have targets? Because actually things were really bad. You know, in our system, people waited um, two years for a hip replacement. You know, people were dying on the waiting list um, for, for um, urgent cardiac surgery because it was taking us eight or nine months. Um, and, you know, right across the public sector, 
um, things were not good. And whilst measures did exist, they were mostly ad hoc and unsystematic, and we weren't being held to account. We weren't being held to account by, by the public and the people we serve, and we weren't, we weren't really being held um, to account by the, the, um, the, the paymaster. So all the reform that went on in our country um, had a, you know, a virtuous intention. And, and we, we did it in a way that kind of made most sense. And um, so we base our measurements on specific quantified targets because it's easier than the alternative. So even though, you know, the consequence of this can be, be very negative, we end up gaming, often we end up with a worse situation than we started with, actually things are being done for a good intention. And, um, but I think there's a problem with it. You know, and this is Edgar Schein. Edgar Schein is like my hero. He is the sort of guru of um, thinking about how you transform, transform culture. And he said, you can't impose anything on anyone and expect them to be committed to it. You know, somebody should have told us that um, in the NHS a while ago. Um, but I think it's helpful to compare an approach to change that's based on compliance with one that's based on commitment. So when we talk about compliance, we say this is the minimum standard, quality standard or performance target that everyone's not got to achieve. Okay? How we coordinate and control the change is through the, you know, holding to account through the hierarchy, through performance management systems, through, through standardisation and reducing variation. The kind of stuff Stephen was talking about yesterday. Um, and, and the thing about compliance is that if we don't comply, there are consequences, you know, and the, the potential of penalties, um, sanctions, financial or otherwise, and shame because, you know, publicly my organisation is shown to be a poor performer and that definitely creates momentum for delivery, okay? And as in the, you know, when we look before at the, um, the way that we do things in the emerging direction, it tends to be based on transaction, okay? When we look at change from a commitment viewpoint, we start from a very different place, okay? We start from a collective goal that, that is meaningful, that makes sense to people, that we can all aspire to, whoever we are, whether we're a patient, a community member, a frontline member of staff, a senior leader, okay, a politician. You know, we can all aspire to that. And the way that we coordinate and control, okay, very much like the left-hand side in that previous diagram, through shared purpose, shared goals, that we create a massive us and us rather than us and them. And how we get commitment to a common purpose um, and you know, being able to do that creates tremendous energy for change because we feel like we're part of a, a bigger movement. And again, you know, as in the emerging direction, we focus on relationship. Okay? If you look at the history of the world of large-scale change okay, and those, organ those leaders, those organisations, those systems that have been able to deliver, okay, it almost inevitably comes from a commitment point of view. You know? um, there's very little evidence anywhere in the world of organisations that have transformed through compliance. Okay, and sustained. I mean, there's quite a lot that have tried, particularly in our country, but, um, but you know, you, you can't, okay? Um, you know, um, you can't drive compliance through compliance. And, but, see, if we, foc on, if we focus on commitment, okay, what it means is that we get compliance, you know, because, we, again, it's like the why, understanding the big why. If we understand the big why of why we're doing it and we've got commitment to that future... Then, then compliance makes much more sense, you know? And, uh, and I'd say this is, where, this is where we need to go. This is where our world is going, okay? We, we absolutely need compliance. If we want safe um, uh, health care um, that, you know, with reduced variation, then we, we um, you know, we have to go there. We have to go for commitment on a very big basis. You see, every one of us who are leaders, we're signal generators. And all the time, we're sending messages out to people in our organisations and systems about you know, um, what is important. And our words and our deeds are just sending these messages out. And they're massively amplified. We don't realise you know, how much other people kind of hang on to our words and it's amplified around the organisation. So, bear that in mind about signal generation. I say one of the biggest problems or issues or risks that we have, certainly in my system, is because as leaders we're, we're signal generators and we're sending out these messages around what's important, what our colleagues are hearing, what our workforce is hearing, is messages about what's important. And what we keep doing is replacing our shared purpose, our bigger goal, our commitment to a different future 
with a de facto purpose, okay? Because, because in the conversations that operational leaders are having with frontline colleagues, what the colleagues are hearing is, is the de facto purpose, you see? What we're doing, so instead of this commitment to a different future that we want for our patients and our colleagues and our community, what, what our workforce is hearing instead is actually the thing that's most important, because it's the thing you're talking to me about the most, is um, hitting the performance target, reducing cost in hospital, reducing length of stay, eliminating waste, eliminating variation, um, competing, completing our activities within the agreed timescale, and complying with an inspection or regulation regime. And if we're not clear about the bigger shared purpose, the commitment, okay, then it's very easy for something else to become the de facto purpose in the minds of our workforce. And, you know, we, um, we, see, this, we see this happening everywhere. And the problem with de facto purpose is it's toxic. You know, you cannot transform an organisation or system through de facto purpose. Right, who knows what this is? You want to guess? Okay, I'll give you a clue. Um, so I like, you know, I love social media and I kind of live in a social media world. And, um, and, and this is a machine that was invented by one of my social media friends. And he's called Simon J. Girlfoyle. And he is a jobbing like police inspector, police officer, and he's also a systems thinking genius. And, and you know, in terms of like being a boat rocker, you know, a radical, rock the boat and stay in it, he's like he's like the number one boat rocker. And um, so he's like rocking that boat all the time. But because he just does brilliant work and he's so insightful, um, you know, um, they, they kind of love him in the police service. Anyway, and, and if you tweet, I would so recommend that you follow um, Simon J. Garfoyle. Do you know, he says to me, every time, Helen, I know when you've been on a platform, because I suddenly get a um, hundred more Twitter followers. Um, okay, so he invented this machine, okay, and I'll tell you what this is. This is a purpose obfuscation ometer okay? And what it does, okay, and I won't tell you what the initials are, you can work that out. Okay, so what the purpose obfuscation ometer does is it takes the commitment-based shared purpose at one end, and it puts it through the machine, and the de facto purpose comes out at the other end, okay? So let's look at some examples. So we'll start off, because Simon obviously is a police officer, so we'll start off with the police, okay? So what goes in at one end, the commitment-based shared purpose? You know, this concerned citizen who has been robbed, okay? They say, please catch the person that burgled my house. And what happens is that the shared purpose goes through the purpose obfuscationometer and comes out the other end as a de facto purpose. We can only afford another 4.3 burglaries per day for the rest of the month, otherwise we'll miss the reduction target. Okay? <laughs> so let's look at another let's look at education. Okay? So here, you know, the wonderful commitment-based shared purpose goes in at this end goes through the purpose obfuscationometer, and what comes out at the other end, the de facto purpose, you know? Schools should be ranked in league tables according to the proportion of students who attain exam results at grades A to C. That's English, but you get the hang of it. Okay. okay, and of course, it never happens in health, does it? So um, this example here is the emergency room. So this, you know, this very distressed and ill um, patient, you know, this, this um, gentleman who thinks that he's having um, a heart attack, like, you know, crawls into the emergency room and says, please cl clutch in his chest, you know, please help me get better, okay? And it goes through the purpose obfuscationometer and what comes out at the other end? A 95th percentile of emergency patients must be admitted, discharged or transferred within four hours of arrival in the department. You know, and we can laugh at this, but it's what we're doing, you know? And so where do I think we need to go in the future, okay? When we're talking about numerical goals um, and targets, they need to be meaningful, you know, because we're moving into an era, the emerging direction where people are engaged because they want to be, not because they have to be. So we've got to make sure, we've got to focus on the why, and, you know, why is this, this number meaningful, rather than just giving numbers to people and telling them you've got to do them, okay? And it needs to, in a sense, we need to be building a narrative um, around these numbers, because the narrative is actually connecting the goal back with the bigger shared purpose, the commitment-based shared purpose that we can all connect with. We need to be investing in measurement capability so that it's, you know, that, that in a sense we've, we've got real skills um, around measurement in our organisations. 
We've got to involve, I think, a lot of people, okay, a lot of different people in, in making sure that we're picking the right performance indicators in the first place, not just a, a small number and why. And you can, you ne we never get it fully right, you know, it's, it's always a trade-off. But in a sense, um, we need to be engaged, okay. We need to understand what is naturally occurring variation. And certainly, you know, in my world of the NHS in England, we're, we're in a scenario often where, you know, we, we have a goal, 95% of patients must be in and out of the emergency room um, within four hours. And so, um, and, um, and we have to submit data every single day. And the manager's like looking and saying, oh my goodness me, you know, you know we, were, um, we were at 97% yesterday and now we're at 93, it's a disaster. But it isn't, it's naturally occurring variation and we need to understand that. So, you know, what we've got to be focusing on is measurement for improvement, you know, um, not just judgment. And, you know, we said at the top about intrinsic motivation. You see, when I look at improvement projects and I look at measurement, okay, um, sometimes I think the measures are extrinsic. They're being done to us, you know. We're having to do it. We don't agree with it. We're being forced. It's being imposed on us. But other times, I see a um, fantastic situation where, where the measurement is intrinsic, you know. People, teams are so excited to measure because they've put so much effort and energy into improving things for their patients and they can't wait to find out, you know. And that's about, you know, about measurement for improvement because we're trying to make things better. It's linked to our shared purpose, not measurement for judgment, which, which pushes us towards de facto. And we can't, and we have to see you know, our measurement in a, in, a bigger, um, in a bigger scenario where, you know, measurement and change are part of a bigger picture that we all understand. So those are my views on measures. And, you know, this is what I'd say, like looking forward, where are things going? I'd say the last era of management was about how much performance, you know, we could, we could extract from people. You know, let's, let's wring them dry to get as much as we can. And I think the next is all about how much humanity we can inspire. And measurement and performance are a key part of that, but it's, but it's humanity-based, it's linked to a bigger purpose. You know, and, and this is a quote here from Don Obedian, who is like, like the father, you know, wonderful um, pioneer of quality thinking in healthcare. And he said, you know, ultimately the secret of quality is love, you know? Everything we do, you know, what drives us for improvement? Actually, why are we here? You know, it's love. And, you know, if we have love in the first place, then we can work backwards. We can do all the measuring, we can do all the monitoring, and we can do all the improving of the system. But we have to start from love. And, um, you know, yeah, what do I think in the future is going to be our tactic for success? Actually, it's love. So coming to the end of um, my little talk, and here are some challenges that... I think we have for the future. First of all, we have to create organisations that are activist at their core because the emerging direction tells us, you know, that, that many of the ways that we've tried to drive change down through the top of organisations in the past isn't enough, okay? I think, and, you know, I am not anti-hierarchy because a hierarchy and organisational structures and holding people to account is really, really important for delivery of healthcare, but it isn't enough. You know, we've got to find ways of like igniting the collective brilliance, the, um, the activism of the, the, the amazing people in our organisations and the people that use our services. Okay? We've got to find ways to marry the, the need for innovation with complexity and scale because the kind of organisations that we work in are highly complex and they're very big scale and we've got to be able to manage that. But we've also got to be able to innovate because we need to be moving forward very, very quickly so that we're moving faster than change itself. And we've got to balance control and freedom. Okay? We have to have control. You know? um, we have to be accountable for the public purse and we have to deliver the performance that we've got to deliver. And we have to have freedom because without freedom, um, without autonomy, um, then, um, then innovation isn't going to happen. And do you know what? I think it's a, a really useful strategy or really useful thinking to say, what if we sought to outlove everybody else? You know, what if we were the kind of organisation or the kind of improvement leaders that, 
that, that, that actually made this an explicit strategy that said, you know, in terms of how we connect with our patients, okay, we're going we're to out-love them. In terms of how we connect with each other as colleagues, in terms of how we behave as managers and leaders, okay, you know, we're going to out-love them. So I have to end with a call to action um, because that's the nature of activists and mobilising and stuff. So, you know, just some things to think about at the end of this talk today. Number one, what are your own opportunities to move to the edge? You know, how can you get one foot out and one foot in and, you know, um, be very focused on your organisation and what it needs, but also be, be looking outwards and bringing in those new ideas and those new relationships, okay? How can you ignite the disruptive innovators in your midst, you know? Where are your um, radical young leaders, your students, your trainees, um, your, your, your patients, your frontline staff? that have got the energy and the great ideas. Um, how can you connect this with your pledge for, for Change Day? Um, change Day is a brilliant catalyst for making this happen. And how can you enable change to happen at a faster rate um, than the outside world? Um, honestly, these things are coming. These trends are coming. It's obvious. And I think every one of us you know, has, a, has a choice to make. You know. Are we going to be part of the future? Are we going to create the future? Or are we going to stick with the way things are because we're kind of scared and we need to be in control? So um, I, know which road I'm I know which road I'm choosing, and I hope you choose the same one. Thank you. <laughs>